Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about my CV Gravis and dogs. Um, so what is it? Um, it's a deficiency of the acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So it's like the junction between nerves and muscles. Um, it disrupts the signal transmission there. So like you have a peripheral nerve coming off the spinal cord and leading to like skeletal muscle. Um, it prevents, there's a close up of it. It prevents um, acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter from binding to these receptors on the muscle. Um, it can be either congenital or acquired, um, and I'll talk about that more on another slide. And it causes muscle weakness and assess, um, excessive fatigue, um, especially um, after exercise. So some symptoms of this, um, like I said, exercise-related weakness, or just in general, progressive weakness that you'll notice. Um, weakness in the hindquarters um, and the limbs. They might have a voice change because it like, affects lots of muscles like in their throat and stuff. So their bark might get higher pitched um, and they may have difficulty swallowing and might have regurgitation because um, a lot of dogs with this um, get a condition called mega esophagus. So their esophagus dilates and loses muscle tone so they have a lot of regurgitation. Um, and they might lose weight. Um, they also might have a drooping lower lip, um, <coughs> excessive drooling. They may sleep with their eyes open or not respond to the blink reflex, which is like poking the corner of their eye and it should make them blink. Um, you might not see that in these dogs or a drooping tail. So the types, there's congenital. Um, there's like a few dog breeds that can get this are prone to this, uh, Jack Russell's, English uh, Springer Spaniels, Smooth Fox Terriers, and Smooth Miniature Dachshunds. Um, in this case, they're like born with the condition. Um, they're born without normal, normal neuromuscular junctions. Um, and there's no really effective treatment for that type. I think they just kind of live with it. But the acquired type is more common, I think. Um, it's an autoimmune disease. So they, uh, their bodies produce antibodies that, um, that target the receptors on the muscle for acetylcholine so that they can't bind to initiate that muscle contraction. Um, and the subtypes um, can be focal. I think the focal is like the most common where it only affects like one place and it's usually the esophagus. Right, and that's that's a good term. Focal, think of focus. It's like focused on one area of the body. Um, and generalized is just like general weakness in all of their muscles. And then fulminating is really serious. It's like acute onset. Oh, is that, because I'm, I'm at a loss of the definition of that word, so. Uh, yeah, I think it's just like acute onset progresses very rapidly. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think most of the time it pop up, leads to death. Okay. And then perineoplastic, um, that's caused by a tumor in the thymus gland, um, but that's like really rare in dogs. It's said only like three to four percent of dogs with MG, it's perineoplastic, <coughs> but it's more common in cats. If... You got a question right over there. Okay. How do they get the acquired? Um, I don't think it's really known for sure why they start making the antibodies against the receptors, but what happens is they just, their body makes antibodies against the acetylcholine receptors. Yeah, and that's like the hallmark of every autoimmune disease. If, you know, you're not, well, maybe you're born with propensity, but it doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. Something happens, so, you know, if you're born with it, it's called congenital. Uh, and that's in, the, in this case, it's the complete absence of the junction, which is terrible because nothing will ever fix that. If an animal's born without these neuromuscular junctions, there's no treatment for that. That's like, if it, it can live, it will, and if it dies, it dies. The acquired, it means you will, something happened later, and maybe some chemicals you were exposed to causes autoimmune disease. Some people are more prone to it. Um, but yeah, it's always the antibodies attaching to the acetylcholine receptors, and then that prevents um, normal acetylcholine from binding to the receptor because you've got an antibody in the way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like I said, the causes uh, can be congenital, 
or immune mediated, where they start producing those antibodies, or a thymoma, which is a tumor of the thymus gland. And this diagram is just kind of showing the neuromuscular junction up close. Um, and this is like how it should look with the receptors and the acetylcholine binding. And then this is the nerve, this is the muscle, so that can cause contraction. Yeah, and that, I mean, those little dots there are the neurotransmitter, and they have to bind to the receptor, whereas in an abnormal case, you have antibodies blocking. So that's crazy. And the risk factors, um, genetics, like those breeds I talked about, um, the tumor, which is rare in dogs. Um, I also read that it can be exacerbated by vaccines. So if you have a dog with this condition, um, talk to your vet about vaccines, because they might not be able to get all the vaccines. Mm, okay, yeah. And see, this whole thing about vaccines, and I just went through this with the border collie, pup, border collie puppies, it's still kind of, controversial between breeders and veterinarians when to give the vaccines, how often, because you know some animals react to like the lepto portion of it and usually vaccines, you know, they have the antigen that whatever you're trying to vaccinate against, but then a lot of it is called the adjuvant, the liquid part that you also inject with the vaccine and it's actually made to irritate to uh, provoke the immune response so you get a better immune response. And so there's this whole thing about the adjuvants and uh, Brittany, the vet that I use for my puppies, she talked actually in the vet clinic that she's working in to go to another type of vaccine that she learned in vet school was probably less reactive than the one they were currently using. So, you know, there is, there is this thing about vaccines. And of course, the ultimate example of that is when uh, some cats develop tumors at the site of vaccine injection. Anybody ever seen that? Yeah. So uh, it's a big controversial thing. I really, if I had some time, I'd like to study it because there's some breeders down in Indy that I know that actually I should go and interview them because they have this thing about um, before they vaccinate their puppies, if I recall, they do a titer. They kind of like determine the titer and then from the titer determine if it's time to vaccinate or not. And I don't have a good handle on it, but this, you know, if you've got an animal with this, what you're saying is some vaccines make it worse, which is interesting in itself. Okay. Um, also, intact females um, have a slightly higher risk. Um, so diagnosing it, um, there's a blood test that can check for the antibodies to the re uh, acetylcholine receptors, um, but apparently they only do it at one location. Yeah, that's true, yeah, and you should, I visited their website, you know, and it's, yeah, there's one woman that runs this lab, and she's got the technique to yeah, determine so it. If you get that, you have to go there, and it takes a couple weeks, um, but it's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that can give more of a quick tentative diagnosis is a tensilon test, um, which is an IV injection of this drug, edrophonium chloride. Um, and what it is, it's a short-acting anti-choline esterase. So an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase is in that gap um, where the neurotransmitter is released. And it, after it binds to the receptor, whatever's left kind of gets like chewed up. Chewed up. Um, and this uh, injection prevents um, that the, enzyme from working. Yeah. So. The chewing up, it prevents the chewing up. Right, so uh, whatever receptors are functional in there, they have more time to bind. To bind the, yeah, the acetylcholine. Yeah. Right. Um, it does have, a, can occasionally cause an airway spasm, and the dog might need to be intubated. Um, and there's a condition, if the dog also has, that can cause a drop in heart rate. But it's pretty dramatic to see like the change, mm -hmm. and I have a video. Yeah, and it's pretty acute, isn't it, right after they yeah, inject? Yeah, it happens like right away. Yeah, like right away. Hit, hit the X <laughs> way up on top. That, yeah, that red X yes. there, yeah. I'll try it again. Hmm. I don't know why it's doing that. <coughs> Somehow it senses it wants to scan it or something. Sorry. 
Yeah, that's okay. It's the computer. It's a cool video. There you go. Okay, yeah. This, this website's good, too. They do a good job. Okay. So this is a dog that um, is getting the tonsillotomy test on. So you can see he's walking like really... Mm -hmm. Can we get one way or something? And here they're getting the injection. <laughs> Kiss on the top of the head always works good. Wow. <laughs> That's dramatic. Yeah. Too bad it's short acting. It's you know it's not Yeah. You can't give that enough. You have to give it all the time. Yeah, that's not like a trick. Look at that. That, that is dramatic. Mm-hmm. Very good. I'm familiar with that website too. That that's a good vet clinic out in uh, LA, I think. No problem. Okay. Um, and they also, the vet may also want to do chest radiographs to check for the mega esophagus condition because um, that's really common with dogs with MG. Mm -hmm. um, up here is like a normal. Yeah, there it is right there. Um, and down here is huge. Yeah. <laughs> so. Looks like three or four times yeah. the diameter. Um, and they also, even though it's not likely, check for the thymus tumor. Um, as far as treatments, like the most popular is uh, an anticholinesterase, so like the Tensilon test, but like longer acting. Um, and this drug, Mestinon, um, it in inactivates acetylcholinesterase. Um, it can give orally two or three times a day. Um, it has some side effects like nausea and stuff, so they say dilute it or give it on a full stomach. Um, that's like the preferred method, but you can also do immune suppression, um, like prednisone, if uh, that method doesn't work, because um, that also suppresses the production of, of those antibodies. Um, in surgery, if they have the thymus tumor, um, and they'll be cured if you remove all the tumor. Mm. So it's the least likely to occur, but it's got the, probably the best prognosis if you take out the thymus. Oh, if you don't give it all, then they'll still have to go through all the others. Yeah. Um, okay. Some more treatments. I'll try to finish up in about a minute if okay. you so. Um, for mega esophagus, like I said, mm -hmm. it can cause regurgitation and weight loss, and also disrupt the uh, reflex that prevents breathing <coughs> during swallowing. Um, so there are some medications that improve movement through the esophagus, and you want to figure out what food consistency your pet digests better. Um, and they say elevated feeding helps a lot. And they make these special chairs mm -hmm. called Bailey chairs. Um, they're really cute. But it like helps gravity move mm -hmm. them down. Um, and they say like for like 20 minutes after they eat, leave them in, in the upright position. Um, and this is like relatively new, the therapeutic plasma exchange. Um, and it's pretty expensive and it's hard to find a place that does it. But they'll take the plaque, they'll take blood from the dog and like take the plasma out because that's the part that has the antibodies, antibodies and exchange it with donor plasma and put it back in the dog. Wow. And that's yeah. been proven pretty successful, I guess. Like yeah, I mean, it makes sense because that's where the antibodies are, but that's a lot of, uh, I bet you that's pretty expensive to do. Yeah, I don't think like most people yeah. have Now, these chairs. Bailey chairs are neat, and sometimes if you're bored, just go to YouTube and uh, do search Bailey chairs. And some of these dogs are so well trained, they're so used to it that uh, there's one on there that it has a chair like this, but it's got like a little flap where the thing comes across, and the dog puts himself in it and then moves the flap over and is ready to eat. It's quite remarkable. Okay. Um, and I had to put another picture on there because it's adorable. Mm -hmm. um, the prognosis is great if they uh, get early detection and treatment, as long as they survive like that first month where the weakness is the worst, and their risk for aspiration pneumonia is the greatest because of the mega esophagus. Um, then they should be fine. They may have like a relapse later in life, but you just treat it again. Um, and they'll get return muscle strain, and the vet will want to follow up with more chest rads and blood work. Um, 
but most dogs recover pretty well, unless they have the like fulminating type. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Okay, ready for questions? Questions, comments, anybody have any experience with this stuff? Anybody? Everybody's kind of like Manic Monday here. Nobody's asking questions. Yeah, it's, it, look at those videos. The Bailey chair is pretty neat. Okay, well, we'll move on. Last